Welcome to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. In this podcast, we will focus on successful marketing methods for advisors that generate prospects and clients. We will learn from the best in the industry on how advisors in the trenches today are growing their practices. Join us for this journey where Brad draws from years of expertise and guest experts to help advisors reach their full potential. Welcome back to the Be Advised Leading with Value podcast with Brad Swinehart of White Glove. Brad has a guest today. It is Luke Acree of Reminder Media. Now, Luke is a sales, marketing, and a team building specialist. And Brad, tell us what you're going to use him for today. Oh, I'm going to pull all the, what do you call them, Luke? Golden nuggets? Yeah, the golden nuggets, man. (laughs) I'm going to try to pull all of those out of him today. Uh, A little background, Luke and I have been good friends for a couple of years now. And one thing that I've always noticed about this guy is he just gets it, you know, from a sales perspective, from a team building perspective, and especially from a, a, a perspective of helping professionals grow their practice and, and Luke is just a guy that just understands relationship marketing and how you can really connect with your ideal prospects. So I'm hoping to pull all of that information out of him today and then share it with the world because, man, it is a powerhouse of knowledge packed into this guy's head. So thanks for being on, Luke. I appreciate the opportunity, man. I'm excited to be here, excited to be on your show. All right. So let's talk a little bit. Um, you guys have over at Reminder Media have built just a massive sales for more impressively than that, you guys have just dialed in to firing these um, employees of yours to become just dynamite salespeople. So how do you do that? How do you coach someone to be better at sales? If you get a, if you, if you had to take me for example, just this terrible salesperson walked in your front door and said, okay, Luke, what, what, what do I do to sell? How do you, how do you take someone like that and then really inspire them to be a, a sales professional like your team is? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I'll give you kind of my take. I think sales is both an art and a science, right? So kind of like sports in a way, you can teach someone the fundamentals of basketball. It doesn't mean they're going to be LeBron James a little bit. That is the art. So take what I say with a grain of salt, but I'll, I'll try to give you some of the science stuff that we tend to implement every day. And then, you know, obviously try to influence the art side by helping people through inspiration. A little bit of my background, so everybody understands, is uh, heavy in phone-based sales. So I have about 220 employees and a hundred, a little over a hundred of those are on the phones every day, making cold calls, calling what we would call as the phone book. And then obviously leads we try to generate online. What I look for kind of from salespeople is very simply we use in order to hire somebody, we use what we call the predictive index, which is like a disc assessment, if people are familiar with the disc. So from a hiring standpoint, we use the predictive index to showcase for us the personalities of the people we're bringing in. We find for sales, and this is kind of obvious for most people listening, we find that people with a high extroversion in their personality and a high dominance and very little patience tend to do well in phone sales. So we start there and we look for that, but it's not just about your personality. There's also another key component that comes down to sales from our side that we feel makes a great salesperson and that's their ambition, their drive, their hunger. And everybody tells me and everybody will tell you if you're hiring salespeople that they have great work ethic and that they're ambitious and hungry. Like everybody tells me they have great work ethic. They got it from their dad or their grandfather or whatever. And I find that Very, very few people do. You know, I challenge my sales team all the time. Hey, you want to make 100K? Well, the top 20% in the world make 100K. Do you have the top 20% work ethic? And if you even go up to the top 1% in the world and what they make, do you have the top 1% work ethic? And challenge them from their experience and what they're after from a hunger side. Because when I get them in the actual sales process or sales training, What we find is that before you can become great at sales, you must be frequent. That's something that I learned from Grant Cardone, who's one of the best sales trainers in the world. Frequency before greatness. And so we will give you a script. We'll give you a process to follow. But it's really about pounding out the dials because sales is a numbers game. And you can take the best sales reps in the world and they understand it's a numbers game that you have to pound the phones. You're never going to be super, super successful on like a one, one call close or magic formula type process. It's all about pounding out the phones. But then when you get to actually your frequency before greatness, you take your script 
And the main thing you want to do with your script and how I would train you up, Brad, if I was training you up, is I would say, look, Brad, there's three processes here for the script. You have to memorize your script, which is the basics. You have to you know, actually be able to regurgitate it and recite it. But more important than memorizing it, the second phase is you have to really understand it at a personal level. You have to understand why you're saying what you're saying. So you really have to memorize it, internalize it is how I classify that, is understanding why you're saying the words you're saying. And the, the sub point I always give to salespeople is a specialist always outsells a generalist. What's a specialist? A specialist, if I'm selling to financial advisors, is someone who understands their lingo, the language, the language about the market, the language about ACATs, whatever industry you're calling on, one of the greatest pieces of advice for salespeople is go and live a day in the life of your customer. Understand their actual business and their actual pain points. So you really have to internalize your script. And then the third point is you have to personalize it. So personalizing is Brad has a different personality than I do, but Brad has a different style than I have. So he has to make it in his own. I always give the example that no actor won an Academy Award by reciting the script, even if they understood it, even if they internalized it, they had to make it their own. And so those are three basic principles that we try to walk people through in our script, you know, and in our processes. Look, you got to memorize this. You got to be frequent before you're great. So it's going to be frequency pounding out the phones, but then you got to internalize it to understand that you're a specialist. You understand why you're saying what you're saying. And then third, you got to make it your own. So that's a ton at you, but that, that's some of the basics. I, I love it. There's a few nuggets in there. I picked up on one. You said that if I was impatient, I'd be a great salesperson. So I think I've already checked that box. That, that makes me really happy. I'm, <laughs> I'm well, on, well on the way to, uh, <laughs> to fitting into Luke Acre's mold here. And, you know, you touched on a little bit, you know, 200 plus sales team members. And I think one thing that you do a very great job at, and I've, I've seen it, been there in person, seen it uh, personally myself, but also the videos that, that you're everywhere. I mean, I can't, I can't open Instagram or Facebook without seeing Luke Acre's face somewhere, but one thing you, you do really well, and I think would, would help financial advisors as well when they're training sub reps and, and, and growing their practice. One thing you do really well that I've always noticed is you inspire your team to get motivated. And like you said, phone sales are smiling and dialing. That can be a grind. That can be awful, but so can being an, an advisor, you know, seminars, doing webinars, meeting with prospects, you know, it, it can be a grind. How do you motivate your sales team on a daily basis? How do you get over that hump of, you know what? Oh man, that was a tough call or that was a tough meeting. What would you give as far as advice to, you know what, let's get that, let's get that motivation back up. Mm. I think what I have learned over the years with salespeople and really just thinking about myself of like one of the best ways for a marketer to be a great marketer or even as a leader is that you got to put yourself in the shoes of other people and you got to put yourself in this perspective of like, well, I've been led by people. What has motivated me? And I think that's a key point for everybody to understand in leadership and motivation of salespeople is don't set out to motivate your sales team for the company set out to motivate them based upon what they want to achieve. And I know that sounds a little cliche, but it really is true and is built up in this one saying is when your why is bigger than your fear, you'll pick up the phone and you'll pound the phone. You'll lift the cinder blocks, meaning you have to find out in that sales rep, and this is an individual thing, you have to find out what does this person want to achieve? Why are they here? Because guess what? If I go to you and can I keep you accountable by KPIs, can I set some key performance metrics for you and hold you accountable from a job perspective? Absolutely. But what's really going to truly to get you to call on a Monday morning after you don't feel like waking up and calling is reminding you that, hey, you told me at the beginning of the year that you wanted to make this much money to put in a college fund for your kid. And I would be a bad leader and a bad boss if I did not remind you of that and point you to that. So do I need you to call because you're an employee of Reminder Media? Absolutely. But more importantly than that, I want to remind you of what you told me and what I told you I'm committed to helping you achieve. Because ultimately what you're doing for people every single day, at least this is what I believe in leadership, is you're trying to help people achieve the best version of themselves, the best version, that next version of what they want out of life. And so what I have found kind of in my years of doing this is that when I hammer people on what they told me they want to achieve, what they told me they want out of their life, then that's what truly will motivate them to pick up the phone. And I always am real with people that, look, it's never going to be glorious. 
to do these sales calls. It's not going to feel great. And it's okay if you go, man, I, this is really hard. I don't really enjoy this. That's okay. You don't have to love it 24 seven. Guess what? When Tom Brady's in the gym and I don't, I can't stand Tom Brady, but you got to respect that guy when he's <laughs> in the film room. I'm sure there's many, many days he goes, I don't want to watch another football game or I don't want to do another workout or I don't want to eat healthy again today or drink the amount of water I'm supposed to intake a day, but he does it because he's trying to achieve something great. And so my, my basis of motivation has kind of been around this idea of, hey, what do you want out of life? And I'm here to help you achieve that. And, and we're a high performance team. And I think this is, this is something that's really affected me recently that I hope helps some of you guys out there that are trying to build a company or build an organization or build a team. I used to, to call my team my family. And this might come across the wrong way to some people, but hear me out on it. I used to be like, hey, we're a family, Brad. Like we're a family, I'm here for you, you're here for me. And it sounds good, right? And it feels good. The problem is it's an, almost impossible to run a great team when it's your family. Because, it, because people expect a level of love and care and everything like that from a family that you can't hold them accountable in the same way. And it becomes very awkward and it breaks down. This is what I've learned at a high level. Instead, what I'm telling people today, hey, yes, we, we love you like family, but we're a high performance team. And guess what? On a team, there's going to be people that sit on the bench. There's going to be people that get cut. There's going to be people that are the high performers that make the most amount of money because they contribute the most to the team. We're a high performance team. And if you join this team, you're going to be part of a team that has a mission to win a championship. And you're going to be functioning in a high performance team. And each of us are going to have to fight for our position, but in a good way towards the goal, not in an impersonal internal politics struggle, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. It's, it sounds to me like you're, you're straddling a, a very fine balance between inspiration, personal inspiration of what they, they want to achieve, combining that with accountability and just realistic expectations. I think the only, the only thing in life that is disappointing is when you don't have proper expectations. And I think that is a, a perfect match. And obviously mm -hmm. you guys have seen success. It, it reminds me of that story and you're uh, walking down the road and there's three guys that are all using bricks to build a wall. They ask the first guy, they say, Hey, wh what are, what are you doing? He says, I'm working. Clearly I'm working. My family needs food. I need to do this. I'm working to provide for my family. You understand that guy's inspiration. They ask the second worker, well, what are you doing? He says, Oh, I'm building a wall. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm rebuilding this wall. Okay. Well, he's got a little bit bigger picture and you can see his inspiration is building something, achieving something. And then they ask the third guy, well, what are you doing? And he says, oh, oh, this wall used to be X, Y, Z in history. It was amazing. I am rebuilding this to its former glory. And it's going to be a big part of the, this, the city's history for years to come. Mm. Each, each one of those three people are obviously doing the same work. But to motivate them, you're going to need to understand what drives them. And that, I think that's exactly what you're saying, Luke, is to, to learn that personal reason of why they're there. Everybody's punched in because they're at work, right? They're all doing the same thing, but how do you inspire them? And you hit it right on the head of if following that up with true expectations and accountability. That's the way to see real success. Man, I love that. I love that story. I'm going to have to use that because I think that's a perfect example or perfect analogy. So let's talk, um, let's pivot. You obviously, your service really helps financial advisors grow their practice, but what do you think the future of marketing in the financial profession is? Where do, where do you think advisors should be focusing today to for their marketing efforts? Yeah, I mean, I this is a little bit of a rant of mine, so hopefully I don't rant, but um, you know, I think if you want to survive in any service-based sales profession today, so that would be financial advising, insurance, real estate, the tons of other professionals uh, fit into that, you have to realize that the world has shifted to personalization and personalization driven a lot of times by data. Um, so this is why the Facebooks and Googles of the world have become so powerful and especially make so much money off of marketing because they understand what Brad searches for. They understand what he looks at, what he's interested in, what he likes, what he engages with. And because of that, they can personalize the advertising up to Brad. See, if, if you bought a car today and you watched a car commercial tomorrow, you wasted 30 seconds of your life. 
you have no need for that because you just fulfilled that need and therefore it's just a waste. And so in servicing in your business, but also from a marketing standpoint, what every advisor should be asking themselves right now is how do I personalize my service? How do I personalize my marketing collateral so it's relevant? Because the key to all marketing is relevancy. The more relevant you can be, and Tony Robbins teaches it this way, in life and to create a great business, you're either helping people overcome a pain in their life that they're experiencing, or you're helping them go towards a desire that they want. And so that's all about relevancy. How can you position your marketing message to connect with someone personally so it's hitting on those key pillars that's going to help them engage with something that is a desire in their life or save them from a pain they're experiencing? And so what I teach my advisors to do and I teach my my clients really to do is how do you make sure now you engage not just on a me, me, me level, which is what most advisors do. If I looked at an advisor's business today and I looked at their nurturing campaigns and all that stuff, I guarantee you nine out of 10 things that they send is all about me, 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 me. It's here's what I'm doing for you. Here's what's happening in the market. Here's what my services bring. Here are new products that are available to you. It all is thinking that it's for the client, but it's really with the me spin. Where I'm actually teaching advisors, there's nothing wrong with giving that information and you do have to give that information. But you want to also be strategic and realize that your clients don't hire you so they can hear 24-7 about finances. They trust you to take care of their financial positioning. So now you need to connect with them at a deeper level to get a relationship with them so they see you not just as Luke, the financial advisor, they see you as Luke, the friend. And the only way to do that is to connect deeper than just the transactional nature of service nature of your business. It's to understand who are their kids. It's to understand, are they a pet owner or not a pet owner? What are the charities they're involved with? Do they go to church? Do they not go to church? All these personal things, when you do that, now you understand messaging wise what to send them. And the example I give all the time is my wife, she's kind of a health nut. She eats super healthy. She's been a vegetarian all those things. So if you send something to my wife, like a vegetarian recipe, and you actually call her up and say, Hey, Megan was thinking about you today. I actually sent you this vegetarian recipe because it made me think of you. And I wanted to make sure you saw it because I thought you and Luke would enjoy it. It's not the fact that you sent her a piece that's a vegetarian recipe. What's so amazing about that is that it's personal to Megan and it gives her that, that um, what I call is that buzz that buzz feeling, that fluffiness almost that triggers reciprocity. And the reciprocity in psychology is if you do something nice for me, if you do something personal for me, I want to return that for you. And what is that that we want as advisors or real estate agents or insurance agents? We want referrals. So in that, when you're triggering that reciprocity, it gives you the perfect opportunity to ultimately trigger referrals. That is super powerful. I, I really think that if you can know your clients on a personal level and, and if there's a way to scale that out, to reach out to them in a nice warm way, I think you hit it right on the head that there has to be more than just information. You have to provide more than to data to your, your clients or even your prospects. You need to show them that, hey, I've got this under control. But by the way, I know you as a person and, and I'm going to take care of you in this fashion. And this is how we can act. Exactly. A good hack I give is I always tell people the Ford method is an incredible kind of methodology to, to build out your client follow up on. The Ford method stands for family, occupation, recreation and dreams. And so if you think of your CRM right now and you think of your client base, do you know if Luke's in your client base, do you know about his family and do you have that documented? Do you know about his occupation, his work, what he's trying to achieve there, where he's going? Do you know about his recreation, his dreams, that he's, you know, loves playing guitar and piano. He likes working out because he's trying to be as fit as Brad. <laughs> do you know that? <laughs> and then do you know, do you know his dreams, right? And where does a financial advisor fit in so insanely well or a real estate agent or anybody in that industry is their dreams, Hey, I'm helping you in your dream of your financial future. I'm helping you in your dreams of accomplishing your home ownership future. So when you know those four pillars and then you tailor your marketing messaging based upon those four pillars, or you tailor your touch points and your follow-ups based upon those four pillars, it's so powerful. And how that aptly breaks down is, man, if you know my family, you know Megan's birthday is February 5th. 
you know, our anniversary, you know, and then all of a sudden you send a marketing piece on that day, or maybe it's not a marketing piece. Maybe you pull out your phone and you go, Hey, Megan and Luke thinking about you guys today. Congrats on your anniversary. Thanks for being clients. Hope this next year is your best one yet. You know, let me know if you ever need anything, but I hope you kids have a great day. And you send that video message through text to me and Megan. That's what's powerful. All triggered based upon this methodology of how do I connect with people on a relationship level, not just transactional. Oh, so many golden nuggets right there. Hopefully we got that locked down. We can break that all out. But a few things that I picked up on, you said right there, Luke, is, you know, the Ford method, that is, it's an easy way to remember how to connect with your processing clients. Of that second, you stroke my ego there a little bit saying I'm fitter than you. So I always appreciate that. And I will, <laughs> and I will say that I have seen a video of drops of Jupiter rocking it out on the piano and that guy crushes it. So uh, there's a little bit of a, little man crush going on between me and Luke right now because I, I love it. And he does, he does a great job. <laughs> what would you, um, what would you say right now you think the biggest pain points for a financial professional or any professional is at this point, what are they missing out on? Um, so I think the, the big wealth transfer, which we're currently in and is going to keep getting bigger and bigger. I think financial advisors, and I, I'm not, I never one that says it's too late. Um, but if you are not connected with the beneficiaries that are going to inherit these accounts, or if you're not connected with the, I call it both halves of the relationship. So the spouse that you never talk to, or the partner that you never talk to, maybe it's, you always have talked to me because I'm Luke and, and I like connecting on the finances, but my wife, Megan never does. If you've never connected with Megan, you're going to lose that. You're going to lose those accounts. And this is a huge problem happening in the industry right now. And you're missing out on so much business. And it's really simple. It's the simple aspect of it is get in front of the beneficiaries and get in front of the spouses in a non-salesy way. Get, there's a reason why they don't talk to you. There's a reason why. And the reason why is because they maybe don't have a huge interest right then in their life to talk about the details of finances or whatever your expertise are. So you've got to reach out and be proactive to connect with them on a level they would want to connect with. I think the great wealth transfer is on us, upon us right now, and is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you have a chance to capitalize on this. But what's the action item you need to go through today? Look at your client list. Do you know all the beneficiaries of the accounts? Do you know them? You need to go through and ask yourself, who's the partner or the spouse in this relationship that I have? And how well do I actually know these? Because we know the stats say only 2% of kids keep their parents financial professional. Only seven, like 70% of widows will move the account after the husband passes away. So, so we, the stats are out there. You all know this. You've maybe heard it like a broken record. The more action item I'm trying to tell you is that it's simple to actually overcome it, but you have to actually do the due diligence of an actual building a relationship with them. I love that. And we'll, we're running up on time here. So one final thought from you, Luke, that I'm going to pry out of your brain. Um, right now, we're under this just crazy climate out there with prospects and clients and all this misinformation and new information. And what do you think an advisor or any professional should focus on right now as far as, you know, there's people that need information. Is it an opportune time to go out and get new leads or should they be really focused on nurturing their client book? Um, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both. Here's the funnel I've been giving to people. I call it care, educate, close. When COVID first happened and all of that transition that we all went through and are still going through has happened, I said the key here is what's the key to crisis communication, right? It's like when a crisis happens, what do the crisis communication experts teach you? They teach you about over communicating. And so what I was trying to share with my client base and share with everybody out there is that, hey, look, you need to be in the care phase of your funnel, which is over communication. And that is reaching out to your clients, letting them know you're there for them, touching base with your older clients, just checking in to see if there's anything you can help them with. You need to reach out from a relationship level, not to really sell them, even not to educate them because the market was so crazy at the time, giving them education, but it's not necessarily from here's what you should do with your finances or here's what products you should be looking at, vice versa. 
Then after you've done the care phase with people, that warms them up to you and makes them more open. And now you can get in with the education, which is really, truly pointing them in the right direction of what you believe they should do as the professional in this industry. What do you believe they should do with the markets the way they are? What do you believe they should do? And then that moves you to the close phase. And the close phase is truly reaching out and asking for the business and asking for referrals. Where Some people disagree with me on this. And I know there's big coaches out there that say never ask for referrals because you get bad referrals. I totally disagree with that. I think you should always ask for referrals. I think you should always ask for the business. Here's why. If you don't ask, you don't receive. But more importantly on the asking, here's what people don't understand about human psychology. Top of mind awareness is key to growing a business. So when you ask, if I asked you, Brad, right now for a referral, you might not give me one. But guess what I just did? I planted a major seed in your mind. I planted the seed that Luke, the financial advisor, wants referrals. And now I get to water that seed. And now in my communication over the next month with you, I get to communicate and it will always trigger back to that ask that I asked you on. And now if I ask again consistently, because you know the data shows that you have to be consistent in your marketing and consistent in your ask, those are the people that truly capitalize on getting referrals. So I think it's a prime opportunity. Care for your clients. Don't call them and ask them for referrals right away. Educate them. And then third, call them, ask them, is there anything I can help you do? Here's what I would advise you to do with your accounts. And then vice versa, do you have any friends and family that I could reach out to, that I could care for, I could educate? and ultimately earn as a client. So that's my, kind of my take on it right now. And that was the correct answer, by the way. The both was the correct answer. You could have just said that. That would have been a lot shorter. Yeah, but I, I can't help um, myself. Next I time, talk too much. <laughs> next time we're going to get you on the piano. I think that'll be our next podcast is we'll just get you on there. I'll play a little guitar. You can play a piano. We'll see what we can do <laughs> together. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Luke. That was great. There's tons of information there that we're going to be digesting. And I really appreciate having you on today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Great all around, very energetic relationship discussion, guys. Thanks, Luke Aker of Reminder Media and Brad Swinehart of White Glove. Now, to get Brad's latest Be Advised Leading with Value podcast, make sure to subscribe with the subscribe button on this page. And you can also share with the share button. Thank you for listening to Be Advised Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of White Glove. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.